28 hours in the water. We were pretty much uh, floating. The story is about a lot of different things. I think uh, certainly the will to live and obviously the ability of the Coast Guard to kind of leverage all the training and all the resources to ultimately save these three gentlemen's lives. That's a big one. It was, it was a pretty nice day to go fishing. Big old red. The fishing was actually coming in. We we're having a good old time, but that's when the chops started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We looked behind the boat and noticed that water was coming through the back. As much as we wanted to get the water out of the boat, because son was in the back of the boat just throwing everything overboard and just bailing out the water as much as he could. Um, we hit maybe two waves, and by then it just started sinking. We decided to basically put on all our life vests. Uh, we grab everything that we can. My phone was already in my pocket, so these my friends' phones were in their pocket. I remember just floating in the water and sons getting one ice chest. I believe I grabbed the other ice chest. We brought it together. That's that was our raft, you know. This is the actual phone yeah. that went into the water yeah. with me. Actual case here too. The minute we got into the water, to the minute we, uh, the following day, we had no signal. Cause we had a goal in mind. To, yeah. To get to the rigs. It takes hours to try to get to these rigs, and we get close. It's like, we missed it, go on to the next rig. So the call came in around 10 o'clock the night of October 8th uh, from one of the family members of one of the persons that was missing. All right, yes, ma'am. If any of circles, can you get onto this call, please? Okay, and do you know what they were wearing? We started calling around to other friends and other family members to see if we could gather any other information. The Coast Guard has received a report of a 20 through 24 foot center console, zero three persons on board reported overdue out of Empire, Louisiana. Yeah, yeah we turned ourselves off to the ICS and hug each other yeah. for most of the night. We would try to get some kind of rest and then get woken up by a wave. Or fish would nibble yeah. on jellyfish. Fish would nibble on you throughout the night. Every 30 to 45 minutes, you get stung by jellyfish. It grabs onto your leg and kind of comes up your leg, and it's like, oh, this is, yeah, and you just try to kick it off. Pretty but, sticky. Yeah. I woke up to like sharp pain to the side of me, and when I looked down, there was a jellyfish just sitting right here. So I have all the lines that stretch from my stomach all the way down to the leg that the one that actually sat in my lap. We didn't get separated, we chose to get separated. I, I really didn't want to, I just, I told them that this is our only hope. There's somewhere in this search area that we created, which is approximately 25 nautical miles by 25 nautical miles. Sunrise that day, Station Venice got underway to begin searching that, that search area, which was roughly the size of Rhode Island. They were joined by a fixed wing aircraft out of uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, and then Air Station New Orleans is MH-60 rotary wing aircraft helicopter. When I made that last trek where I decided to pull out the phone and then caught a signal, you know? I threw one text message out there for pretty much like a Hail Mary and it got accepted, it got caught. I received a text message from Paul's wife that was essentially a screenshot of the conversation that Paul had had with one of his buddies saying, hey, my boat flooded and I sank, we're floating in the Gulf of Mexico. And then he attached a screenshot of his, uh, you know, the blue dot on the map. Uh, we weren't even sure, it, it didn't come with any GPS coordinates. This pattern here, this Victor Sierra, that was the pattern that was created from the cell phone image. Sure enough, maybe two minutes after getting in that location, my flight mech spotted the individual in the water, the first man, that was Paul. We saw a field of jellyfish, we saw a bright orange life jacket, and we saw a very distressed uh, survivor waving his arms back and forth frantically. Door in the way, clear out back and left. Yeah, uh, I, I swam up to the survivor. He was beat up, his, his skin was peeling off from salt water and sunlight, uh, and he just looked exhausted. Hey, taking a look. came up and he was just shivering, so cold. But when I looked back, um, he just smiled at me. He was just so, so happy that he had been rescued. I, I don't think he could believe it, and he just kept asking about his friends, uh, Sonny and Luan. At that very same time, we got a report in our headsets from the fixed wing asset. Hey, we found it, we found the other two. When they spotted us, when they gave us a signal, it wasn't over yet, because we still had those sharks underneath us. We wanted to hurry up and get out the water. The shark face was probably about 12 to 14 inches in front of me. I remember seeing the teeth, I remember seeing the eyes, 
on the side and I just kept looking. I had his eyelids closed and that's when he was gnawing on the uh, life jacket. And I was like, man, he won't go anywhere. So I was like, what did I do? It was like, pop, pop him in the eyes. And he took off. I still have the life jacket in the air station and you can perfectly see the teeth that wrapped around the life jacket and just ripped it right in half. At that point they vectored in a uh, station, the small boat station Venice. You really can't see much because when you're going up they're going down, when you're going down they're going up. So it's like I didn't see them until they were 20 foot off the bow. And... Yeah we got over the boat we could actively see them actually pulling out uh, the survivors and we could see the sharks uh, encircling the survivors in the water as they're being pulled onto the small boat. There was about seven sharks in the water when they pulled them out of the water there. Six to seven feet, maybe maybe seven to ten feet, some of them. Big enough to take an arm off, that's for sure. We ended up picking them up off the boat after that um, because they had suffered hypothermia and some minor bites to their fingers from sharks. Hey, back to clear the vessel, clear back and left. When we hoisted the other two from the small boat, uh, I could visibly see all of them are exhausted, but they're all just overloaded with joy that they had all survived. They kind of gave each other a high five from what the guys said in the back and then just went right to sleep. <laughs> and I remember sitting on the couch and getting the phone call. And anytime I got a phone call, I put it on, on speaker. And um, Lieutenant Kevin Keefe said that, hey, we found them. And there was this, this sudden quiet, and just quiet. Like we were all like, <gasps> It was really just like, this uh, overwhelming sense of disbelief, like, oh my God, I can't believe we found all three of them in the water and they're okay. Cases like these are the ones that are keep you going. It's why I'm here today. It's why I serve in the Coast Guard. It's why I became a pilot was to do that exact thing and to be able to bring them home to their families. I came home from the hospital to find out that I'm having a baby. So God brought me back for a reason. Our family is very grateful for just everything that you've done. They all were able to come back because of the Coast Guard, and we can't thank them enough. <laughs>